Chapter 2, Section 8. Why should we reject the anarcho-capitalist definitions of freedom and justice? Simply because they lead to the creation of authoritarian social relationships and so, and so to restrictions on liberty. A political theory which, when consistently followed, has evil or... Is there a word worse than evil? Consequences is just bad theory. For example, any theory that can justify slavery is obviously a bad theory. Slavery does not cease to stink the moment it's seen to follow your theory. As right libertarians can justify slave contracts as a type of wage labor, see section, uh, chapter 2, section 6 for this, as well as numerous other authoritarian social relationships, it's obviously a bad theory. It's worth quoting Noam Chomsky at length on this subject. Consider, for example, the entitlement theory of justice. According to this theory, a person has a right to whatever that he has acquired by means that are just. If by luck or labor or ingenuity a person acquires such and such, then he is entitled to keep it and dispose of it as he wills, and a just society will not infringe on this right. One can easily determine where such a principle might lead. It is entirely possible that by legitimate means, say, luck supplemented by contractual arrangements freely undertaken under pressure of need, one person might gain control of the necessities of life. Others are then free to sell themselves to this person as slaves, if he is willing to accept them. Otherwise, they're free to perish. Without extra question-begging conditions, this society is just. The argument has all the merits of a proof that 2 plus 2 equals 5. Suppose that some concept of a just society is advanced that fails to characterize the situation just described as unjust. Then one of two conclusions is in order. We may conclude that the concept is simply unimportant and of no interest as a guide to thought or action, since it fails to apply proper, uh, properly even in such an elementary case as this. Or, we may conclude that the concept advanced is to be dismissed in that it fails to correspond to the pre-theoretical notion that it intends to capture in clear cases. If our intuitive concept of justice is clear enough to rule social arrangements of, of the sort described as grossly unjust, then the sole interest of a demonstration that this outcome might be just under a given theory of justice lies in the inference by reducto ad absurdum to the conclusion that the theory is hopelessly inadequate. While it may capture some partial intuition regarding justice, it, is evidently, it evidently neglects others. The real question to be raised about theories that fail so completely to capture the concept of justice in its significant and intuitive sense is why they arouse such interest. Why are they not simply dismissed out of, hands, uh, out of hand on the grounds of this failure, which is striking in clear cases? Perhaps the answer is in part the one given by Edward Greenberg in a discussion of some recent work on the entitlement theory of justice. After reviewing empirical and conceptual shortcomings, he observes that such work, quote, plays an important function in the process of blaming the victim and of protecting property against egalitarian onslaughts by various non-property groups, end quote. In ideological defensive privileges, exploitation and private power will be welcomed regardless of its merits. These matters are of no small importance to poor and oppressed people here and elsewhere. This extended quote you can be found in the Chomsky Reader, page 187 to 188. It may be argued that the reductions in liberty associated with capitalism is not really an iniquitous outcome. But such an argument is hardly fitting for a theory proclaiming itself libertarian. And the results of these authoritarian social relationships? Well, to quote Adam Smith, you know, the father of capitalism, under the capitalist division of labor, the worker, quote, has no occasion to exert his understanding or exercise his invention. And he naturally loses, therefore, the habit of such exercise and generally becomes as stupid and ignorant as it is possible for a human creature to become. 
the worker's mind falls, quote, into that drowsy stupidity, which in a civilized society seems to benumb the understanding of almost all of the inferior ranks of people. Cited by Chomsky, page 187. Of course, it may be argued that these evil effects of capitalist authority relationships, uh, relations on individuals are not so iniquitous or that very real dominations of workers by bosses is not really domination. But that suggests a desire to sacrifice real individuals, their hopes and dreams and li lives to an abstract concept of liberty, the accumulative effect of which would be to impoverish all our lives. The kind of relationships we create within the organizations we join are of as great an importance as their voluntary nature. Social relations shape the individual in many ways, restricting their freedom, their perceptions of what freedom is and what their interests actually are. This means that in order to be non-farcical, any relationship we create must reflect in their internal workings the critical evaluation and self-government that created them in the first place. Sadly, capitalist individualism masks structures of power and relations of domination and subordination within seemingly voluntary associations. It fails to note the relations of domination resulting from private property. And so, quote, what has been called individualism up until now has only been a foolish egoism which belittles the individual. Foolish because it's not individualism at all. It did not lead to what is established as a goal that is the complete, broad, and most perfectly attainable development of individuality. Kropotkin, Selected Writings, page 297. This right libertarian lack of concern for concrete individual freedom and individuality is a reflection of their support for freer markets, or economic liberty, as they sometimes phrase it. However, as Max Stirner noted, this fails to understand that, quote, political liberty means that the polis, the state, is free, not therefore that I am free of the state. It does not mean my liberty, but the liberty of a power that rules and subjugates me. It means that one of my despots is free. The ego in its own, page 107. Thus, the desire for free markets results in a blindness that while the markets may be free, the individual within it may not be. As Stirner was well aware, quote, under the re uh, regime of the commonality, the laborers always fall into the hands of the possessors of the capitalists, therefore, page 115. In other words, Right libertarians give the greatest importance to an abstract concept of freedom and fail to take into account the real concrete freedom is the outcome of self-managed activity, solidarity, and voluntary cooperation. For liberty to be real, it must exist in all aspects of our daily life and cannot be con contracted away without seriously affecting our minds, bodies, and lives. Thus, the right libertarians' defense of freedom is undermined by their insistence of the concept of neg negative liberty, which all too easily translates in experience as the negation of liberty. Newman's, uh, Newman's Liberalism at Wit's End, page 161. Thus, right libertarians' fundamental fallacy is that contract does not result in the end of power or domination, particularly when the bargaining power or wealth of the would-be contractors is not equal. As Carol Pateman notes, quote, ironically, the contractarian ideal cannot encompass a capitalist employment. Employment is not a continual series of discrete contracts between employer and worker, but one contract in which a worker binds himself to enter an enterprise and follow the directions of the employer for the duration of the con contract. As Hugh Benyon has bluntly stated, workers are paid to obey. Page 148 in the sexual contract. This means that the employment contract, like the marriage contract, is not an exchange. Both contracts create social relations that endure over time, social relations of subordination. Authority impoverishes us all and must therefore be combated wherever it appears. That is why anarchists oppose capitalism, so that there shall be, quote, no more government of man by man by means of accumulation of capital, Proudhon cited by Woodcock in Anarchism 110, uh, page 110. If, as Bookchin pointed out, the object of anarchism is to increase choice, 
Ecology of Freedom, page 70, then this applies both to when we are creating associations and relationships with others and when we are within these associations or relationships with others, i.e. that they are consistent with the liberty of all. And that implies participation as self-management, not hierarchy. So-called anarcho-capitalism fails to understand this essential point, and by concentrating purely on the first condition for liberty, ensures a society based upon domination, oppression, and hierarchy, not freedom. It is unsurprising, therefore, to find that the basic unit of analysis for these so-called anarcho-capitalist right-leaning libertarians is the transaction, the trade, the contract. The freedom of the individual is seen as revolving around an act, the contract, and not in our relations with others. All the social facts and mechanisms that proceed, surround, and result from the transaction are omitted. In particular, the social relations that result from the transaction are ignored. Those and the circumstances that make people contract are the two unmentionables of right libertarianism. For anarchists, it seems strange to concentrate on the moment that a contract is signed and ignore the far longer time the contract is active for. If the worker is free when they sign a contract, slavery soon overtakes them. Yes, the voluntary nature of decision is important, but so are the social relationships we experience due to those decisions. For the anarchist, freedom is based upon the insight that other people, apart from indeed because of, having their own intrinsic value also are means to my end. That is, through their freedom that I gain my own, so enriching my life. Or as Bakunin put it, I who want to be free cannot be because all the men around me do not yet want to be free, and consequently they become tools of oppression against me. Which was also further quoted by Malatesta. Therefore, Anarchists argue that we must reject the right libertarian theories of freedom and justice because they end up supporting the denial of liberty as the expression of liberty. What this fails to recognize is that freedom is a product of social life and that, in Bakunin's words, no man can achieve his own emancipation without at the same time working for the emancipation of all men around him. My freedom is the freedom of all since I am not truly free in thought and in fact except when my freedom and my rights are confirmed and approved in the freedom and rights of all men who are my equals. Other people give us the possibilities to develop our full human potentiality and thereby our freedom. So when we destroy the freedom of others, we limit our own. To treat others and oneself as property, argued anarchist L. Susan Brown, objectifies the human individual, denies the unity of subject and object, and is a negation of individual will. Even the freedom gained by the other is compromised by this relationship, for to negate the will of another to achieve one's own freedom destroys the very freedom one sought in the first place. Page 3, The Politics of Individualism. Fundamentally, it is for this reason that anarchists reject the right libertarian theories of freedom and justice. It just does not ensure individual freedom or individuality. 